Thank you all very much for, for coming today. Uh, my name is Dan Golden. I'm the director of machine learning at Arteris. Uh, Arteris is a company that's focused on using a combination of cloud computation and artificial intelligence to make radiology faster and more accurate. And I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, some work that we've done that's really more in the research phase right now. We do have commercial products, which I'll mention, but this, some of this work is more in the research phase and it's focused on helping clinicians more accurately make diagnoses for lung nodules that may or may not be cancerous. So a little bit about Arteris by the numbers here. And these are all, this is slide is maybe a month or two old, so these are all lower bounds right now. We've processed over 25,000 patient cases on our cloud-based platform. We have over 170 clinicians spread over over 100 different hospitals uh, on our network. Our cardiac product, which is our first commercial product, is now regulated in over 28 countries. And we have five US FDA class two clearances. We have 70 employees, maybe a little bit more now, spread across three offices in San Francisco, Calgary, and Paris. And we have OEM distribution partnerships with two of the three major M uh, MRI vendors, that is uh, Siemens and GE. And to date, we've received $45 million in venture funding, including our most recent round in November of 2017. So we currently have three products. One is for sale right now. All of them are FDA cleared. Our cardiac product is our first product that has been for sale since uh, early 2017. It was actually the first ever FDA cleared product that uses a combination of cloud computation and deep learning for medicine. Um, and that's what's cleared in 28 countries right now. And we're also very happy we recently, in February of this year, got clearance for our lung and liver uh, AI products, which are focused on uh, cancer detection segmentation and tracking in the lung and liver. Um, so I'm going to be focused on some research that we're doing on our lung product. And I do want to say up front, because if I don't, I might get in trouble, that some of the software I'll be describing here is still in the research phase. It's not currently cleared for clinical use. Again, we have cleared products. I'm going to be talking about some of our features that are not yet cleared. Uh, so again, this focuses on lung cancer. I'm going to be focusing on that, that vertical segment of our products. And lung cancer is a major public health crisis among all cancers in the U.S. Lung cancer actually causes more deaths than the three next most fatal cancers combined. So it is the most significant uh, cancer concern in the U.S. and worldwide. There's an upside, though, which is that uh, recent studies have proven pretty conclusively that screening for lung cancer via low-dose CT really does save lives. And that's the conclusion from uh, a paper published in 2013 that was based on the National Lung Screening Trial in the US, which showed that when compared to more conventional screening methods with uh, planar chest radiography, low-dose screening via, chest, uh, via um, CT imaging makes a statistically significant reduction in deaths due to lung cancer. And that's why low-dose CT screening is recommended in the US and in Europe and other countries as well. So that's the upside, but screening still has a lot of challenges. The first thing is that it's very time consuming. A, a hospital with a screening program can screen many different uh, images per day, and this can take three minutes on the lower bound if there are no nodules found in that, uh, in that study, but it can be 10 or more minutes if nodules are found that need to be categorized, characterized compared to previous studies and so on. Screening is also very challenging. There are a lot of nuances to screening. Uh, nodules can be missed even by expert uh, radiologists, especially if they are subtle, if ground glass nodules are, have a very low opacity, uh, excuse me, high translucency, low opacity, so they're hard to see. Um, and then nodules can be abutting other structures within the lungs, such as the chest wall or vessels, which makes them very hard to detect. And then finally, even though uh, low-dose CT screening does save lives, it does so only by virtue of uh, recommending patients who do have nodules to a secondary test, which is typically invasive biopsy, which means that patients who have nodules that are found in screening are subject to uh, bi biopsy, which removes some of the tissue where it can then be examined by pathologists. And the big problem here is for patients who don't actually have cancer, who have nodules that are not cancer, that are perhaps some form of infection or calcification, that then get biopsies which, which turn out to be negative. So those patients don't benefit from those biopsies. So there's a critical need here to reduce the number of unnecessary biopsies in these patients. Because biopsies are not only invasive, but they can also cause health problems of their own, such as infections and other issues. 
So we have a deep learning based approach to tackle a lot of the challenges of, of screening. Uh, the first two technologies I'll talk about are part of our lung nodule detection network, which consists of two stages, a proposer and then a false positive reduction classifier. Uh, we also have deep learning model to segment nodules so that we can fully characterize their volume and texture and so on. And then the, the main focus of this talk is on similar image retrieval. So that is retrieving similar images uh, to the current image or nodule that the clinician is looking at to help them make a diagnosis and recommend a biopsy or not. So the data set on which we train these models is the LIDC IDRI data set. This is a very popular data set. Um, if you see a lot of uh, lung cancer focused deep learning startups popping up in the last few years, it's largely due to the virtue of this open data set, which is very, very well annotated and free uh, for all to download. Uh, this data set consists of over a thousand CT scans, each of which was reviewed by four annotators who both detected and segmented nodules. So it's a very rich data set. There are over 1,300 nodules in the data set. Some patients have no nodules, other patients have multiple nodules. Um, and when we use a data set, we do a pretty standard training validation and test set split of 80, 10, 10%. And we use that same split across all of the models I'll discuss. So the first stage is part of our lung nodule detection network. And this is a proposal network, a network that's focused on finding as many nodules as possible uh, with great sensitivity, possibly at the risk of specificity. So we do this via a 2D UNet based segmentation network that takes in one slice at a time, as well as surrounding slices as context in multiple channels. And then the output of this model is a segmentation mask, where the fully connected components in that segmentation mask represent individual nodule proposals. And again, the purpose is to find as many nodules as possible. And in our preliminary results on this data set, we have recalled about 95% of nodules. The second stage in the detection network is a false positive reduction classifier. So this is built as a 2.5D nine plane ResNet classifier. And by 2.5D, I mean that within this volume, because again, these scans are volumetric, we take nine slices distributed in solid angle and then sort of stack them as channels to the network, similar to how RGB channels are RGB channels are stacked for an ImageNet based network um, and then send that through to the classifier. Uh, so it's kind of like not quite 2D, not quite 3D here. And again, the purpose of this step is to reduce the number of false positives uh, output from the proposal network. And in our preliminary results, when we combine those two stages together into one system, we find we have about 92% recall at two false positives per scan, which is a standard metric here, uh, for nodules that are larger than six millimeters in diameter. And that six millimeters is relevant because that is, per the current guidelines in the US, the minimum size of nodules before which secondary follow-up, say more screening or biopsy is recommended. Currently, nodules smaller than six millimeters are not recommended for any follow-up so they don't really need to be detected. The third stage, that was the detection network. The third stage is for segmentation. This allows us to characterize nodules based on their volume and other aspects such as shape and texture. And we do this via a 3D ENET based segmentation network. Uh, ENET is similar to UNET and that's a semantic segmentation fully connected network style architecture, but it's really optimized to reduce memory and computational requirements. So inference can be very fast and also training can be very fast in this network and the accuracy is about the same as UNET. And the results that we have right now uh, are that we have error in terms of estimating the volume of nodules comparable to the expert radiologists from the LIDC IDRI data set. So that's something we're pretty, pretty happy with. And uh, just to sort of drive home the, the points of uh, how our segmentation network works and how it's within the, the bounds of accuracy of these expert annotators, I'm gonna propose to the audience here a little Turing test. So I'm gonna ask you all to identify which of these segmentation results are from our algorithm and which are from the expert annotators. So each, this is only one nodule here, each row is a different view, a different slice through that same nodule. Each column is a different annotator, one of which is our algorithm, four of which are annotators from this LIDC data set. And of course, this is in the test set, so this wasn't part of our training set. Um, I should point out that in column C, the annotator, be it our algorithm or the expert annotator, declined to identify this structure as a nodule. Uh, so I'll give you five seconds to look at this, make a decision about which one you think is our algorithm, and then I'll quickly poll the audience. All right, who thinks it's A is our algorithm? Few hands. B? About the same as A. C? Nobody? D? A little bit more? E? 
So I would say there's a very slight preference for E, with D as a close second. The answer is we are A. And I probably wouldn't have shown you this example if I thought you'd get it right, because this kind of does drive home the point that we are on parity with the expert annotators. And we've, this is like one, one slightly cherry-picked example to show that, but then of course we have the statistics to back it up as well, um, which I'm not going to show in this talk. One thing to point out is that there are a lot of different uh, ways to segment the nodule in that first slice, that's row number one at the top. And that's because a lot of clinicians actually use semi-automated tools, like some sort of flood fill tool, and then they correct any errors. And just like probably in real life, annotators for the LIDC dataset didn't correct the fact that this, uh, this tool, the semi-automated flood fill tool, incorrectly included what we think is a vessel in the segmentation of the nodule. And this is sort of an error that a, a clinician would say they could fix, but in practice, there are many times where they probably don't fix it. So there really is an advantage to having a fully automated tool that can do all parts of the nodule properly without needing too much correction. So the fourth, that was all uh, stages one, two, and three, detection and segmentation. The fourth stage is similar nodule retrieval. So this is a format of content-based image retrieval, or CBIR, if you're familiar with that. And this is a way of retrieving images of nodules similar to the query nodule, which is the nodule that the clinician is currently examining and deciding whether to biopsy. Uh, for this, we actually repurpose the false positive classifier where we take off the last layer, which is deciding true or false. This is a true nodule. And we're left with about 1,000 features from our deep warning network. And in that 1,000 dimensional feature space, that's where we're actually looking for similarity for other nodules. So this is, on the left, a TSNI plot showing just two dimensions, say, of similarity for a query nodule. Um, but we do this in 1,000 dimensions, along with two additional dimensions from uh, directly measured size and intensity of the nodule, which we get from our segmentation network. So we have 1,000, let's say 1,002 features, including those two more explicit ones. And now I'm going to take a great risk and try to show you a live demo showing you how this works. So let's see if I'm successful here. This is a live version of our application running on AWS, uh, where what I'm going to do is pull up a scan of a patient with nodules that were detected segmented, segmented and then uh, I'll show the, the CBIR or similar retrieval interface as well. So this is a lung CT study. This is a three-dimensional data set. I can slice scroll through here. Um, and it's worth noting that all of the rendering and all that is actually happening on AWS. And as I scroll through, images are being sent down to the client. So this is all like totally cloud-based. If I move my mouse up here, you'll see I'm in a browser window. This is in Chrome and so on. So uh, I can show you that right now here, there is a nodule that was detected over here. There are a few more throughout the scan, which I'll just skip. Uh, going through for now because I'm not a good radiologist and probably won't be able to find them in time. So let's drill down into that first nodule that was detected. And this is sort of the interface, again, in research that we're proposing for similar image retrieval. So now we see a zoomed in version of the nodule along with the segmentation that was done by our segmentation algorithm. This is just showing 2D, but the segmentation is 3D. Uh, and then the radiology, uh, we can just see some, some general characteristics in the upper right, uh, diameter, volume, et cetera, of the nodule. And then clinicians can also go in and use this like, little AI analysis tool for a similar image retrieval. And this has returned the 10 most similar nodules to so this query nodule. Again, the query nodule is the one on the left of interest. Uh, the 10 most similar nodules based on these deep warning features as well as a few other features. And how the radiologist might use this interface is they'll look at the retrieved nodule, and especially, this is a little bit subtle here, sorry about that, at the biopsy results for that retrieved nodule. And if the retrieved nodule, uh, based on the clinician's assessment, is very similar to their query nodule, they'll put a lot of stock in the biopsy results for that retrieved nodule, because again, these are all biopsy-proven nodules. In this case, maybe the algorithm is, needs to be refined a little bit more, but I would say that this retrieved nodule is not very similar to our query nodule. The query nodule has diffuse margins, a lobulated shape, and so on, whereas the, the return, return nodule has sharp margins, a very flat um, texture and so on, maybe with some fine, fine texture in there. In the end, it looks different. So as a radiologist, I might discount this return result, go on to the next one. And here we actually see a nodule that is quite similar to our query nodule, still with that lobulated shape, diffuse margins, similar texture, and so on. And in this case, the biopsy result was positive, that this was actually a cancer. So as a radiologist, I might incorporate this information along with my training and so on and make a decision that 
because this retrieve nodule is so similar to my query nodule and had a positive biopsy, I would also recommend a biopsy for the nodule I'm examining right now and use this information to sort of make these treatment decisions. Uh, and then there are other retrieve nodules, which I'll skip. So that's the quick demo there. Uh, let's see. So just a few interesting implementation details for all of these different networks. There are actually three neural networks here because we repurposed that classifier for these two things, for the re uh, retrieved um, images as well. Inference time is about 90 seconds on a modern uh, Pascal-based NVIDIA GPU. About half of that is GPU time, and interestingly, about half of that is CPU time for things like morphological operations, image warping, stitching the results together, and so on. So there are some uh, low-hanging fruit opportunities for improving the inference time. And it's important to note 90 seconds is a long time if you're waiting for it. All this inference can be done in pre-processing as soon as the study is uploaded before the radiology view radiologist views it. So that 90 seconds, it could be a few minutes. It really actually wouldn't matter because it's all done by the time the radiologist looks at the studies. Um, we use some standard distortions for training these models, some optimized loss functions. Nodules are extremely small with respect to the size of the scan, so they require some sort of hand-holding for the networks to help allow them to focus on the nodules sometimes. Um, and then we do some standard hyperparameter optimization via random search. Um, a lot of this work was done not by myself, but by my team, so I really have to explicitly thank them for, for working on that. Um, and I also think it's worth thanking the curators of the LIDC and IDRI data sets and the NLST data set because um, without that, this would be much more arduous. We'd have to collect our own annotations and so on. And many different companies have benefited from that. And I also want to thank our clinical co-founder, Albert Shaw, who helped a lot not only with this presentation, but also with the design of our sort of demo system. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say that we're hiring, like many other companies here, I'm sure. And um, I also want to say that we do promote uh, diversity on our team, and we really strongly encourage women and other underrepresented minorities in this space to apply. Um, if you're interested or you just want to chat about this or anything else, feel free to contact me at dan at arteris.com. Always happy to chat. And that's all. Thank you. <laughs>